Hello and welcome to the Football Hipsters podcast on a bright and breezy, I can't say summer yet, but we'll go with autumn day here in the UK. I am your host, Chris, and as usual, we've got plenty of football chatter to get ourselves into this week from Europe's top four leagues and a bit from outside there as well. I am joined by two of my regular cohorts this evening. Uh, first of all, it's a good evening to our resident Serie A expert, Mr. John Welsh. Evening, John. Evening, Chris. And also to our newbie incoming, I can't really call him any newbie anymore, can I? It's uh, it's Joel Mawa of our La Liga fame. Evening, Joel. Good evening, Chris. Right. Uh, no, Drew, as uh, you may have guessed from last week, um, he will be working probably until the end of the season. But we like to give him a little nod as usual. Uh, so if you uh, if you miss Drew, give him a little follow at AFC and uh, AF, at AFC. Was it 1410? That's the one. Uh, AFC BVB 1410, sorry, on Twitter. So give Drew a little follow. And as usual, our show is brought to you by classicfootballshirts.co.uk. Have a look online, whether you're a full hipster or classic collector, they have something for you. And don't forget, if you want 10% off, use the promo code CFSAW10 and you'll get yourself a little bit of discount. Right, uh, we are pushed for time on this week's show, so it might be a bit of a shorter show. So we've got plenty to get ourselves into. Uh, And just for a change, on this happy summer's day or autumn's day as we said we're going to start in france this week because i'm feeling fruity so i shall hand the show straight over to john and we go for this week's french roundup with this week's liga Right, straight into Liga this week. Uh, Chris, we're going to talk about your boys who had a daunting away trip to Lyon. Um, Lyon been in pretty good form. Lorient obviously languishing down the bottom. Really need the points. Um, to say, well, apparently this is Lyon's worst home defeat for something like 11 years. Uh, it's yeah. suffered at the hands of Lorient. I have no idea how this happened. What on earth's going on? <laughs> well, in theory, nor do I either. But um, I think last week, didn't we, we? We said obviously our games. We like to pick out a game to watch each week. Um, and I said it, it, this was probably the one to watch. I thought there'd be goals. I thought there'd be action. Both teams kind of needed to win. Did I really expect Lorient to go to Lyon and win at all? No. Did I expect them to score four goals? No. Uh, did I expect them to win when they went a goal behind? No. But all of those three things happen. Uh, Corentin Tolisso uh, fired Leon in front. And at that stage, um, I'll be honest, I was... Well, I learned from my lesson of turning off during the Nancy game recently when they came back from 2-0 down at 1-3-2. I didn't turn off, but I was kind of watching whilst doing other things for 10 minutes because I thought, hmm, this could be a long night. But um, things got better. They got a lot better. Um, I don't know if you've seen this goal, John, but uh, Majid Waris. Oh, yes, with, I did uh, see that goal. Yeah. Oh, picture perfect. It's what I like to call the classic Chris Carpenter FIFA goal. Because it's the goal <laughs> I score over and over again if I'm playing FIFA because it's the only one I'm any good at. Um, so lovely curling shot from the left-hand edge of the penalty area um, into the far corner past uh, Anthony Lopez. And, and always looking pretty good at this stage. And quite frankly, if you'd have blown the whistle, not just for halftime, full-time, I'd have taken that. Um, but then the unthinkable happened. A mistake on the right-hand side from Rafael De Silva, um, who Man United fans will, will know well. Um, ball fell into Macanjo, who got there ahead of Lopez, pulled it back. And uh, Newcastle legend, maybe not, Sylvain Marvo um, popped, uh, popped the, the second goal in. And at that stage, with uh, Lorian 2-1 up, well, I mean, dreamland, I think it's fair to say. Um, and then it, it got better again. It has to be said that uh, Leon had a couple of good chances to get level. Uh, particularly, uh, I think it was around about 10 minutes after that goal, Fakir had a really good chance, which Lecomte saved well. To be perfectly honest, uh, Fakir should have scored, but he didn't. And then, wouldn't you know it, two late breakaway goals. Uh, another goal from Mukanjo um, was a very, very, very nice uh, take from a, a centre coming in from the uh, edge of the box. Nicely worked goal, actually, to be fair. And a good finish at the near post from Mukanjo to make it 3 1. And then, with time dying out um, and everything seemingly done, another breakaway goal goal in the very very last minute just to seal the points um, Mukanju second and that was that so 
just an amazing performance, really, from Lorient. Um, they've won three on the bounce. Who'd have thought we'd have been saying that? And I know I, I freely held my hands up and said that's probably it for Lorient. They were doomed a few weeks ago. Well, all of a sudden, uh, a couple of wins more and they'll be mid-table. So all is not lost. They are 18th in the table now in the um, fabled playoff spot, which uh, Liga has this season, um, where obviously the, the team bottom or the third bottom of Liga will play off against the team third top in Ligue 2. So, um, yeah, at the moment, all is looking for Rosie for Leon, for Lorient, sorry, for three, three straight wins. Not so Rosie for Leon, who we will come on to uh, when we come on to our next game. Um, really, really disappointing week for, for Leon ahead of, of course, a big European trip. They did, let, they did rest Alex Lacazette and a couple of other key players. Maybe in hindsight that will come back to bite them. Um, and that officially means, by the way, that Lyon cannot finish in the Champions League spots this season. Yeah, um, just I was not expecting that result at all. I'm sure that was a coupon yeah. buster for quite a few people. Um, yes. Another result from Liga this week, which would not have pleased Lyon at all, was uh, Bordeaux, a uh, comfortable win at home against Metz. Um, I mean, this is huge, really, because Lyon, obviously, like you said, trying to rest players for their Europa League tie coming up, but could cost themselves a spot in Europe um, from what they've done now because of this result for Bordeaux. Yeah, Bordeaux, um, it's, it's weird. I remember at the start of the season, I said they'd be one of the teams to watch. And, and I actually thought it'd be because of the old phantom Menez. But he's done pretty much next to nothing, actually, this season um, since he signed for Bordeaux. But they've got progressively better and better as the season's gone on. And uh, they've got some very, very good young players um, that they've got. I think the thing with Bordeaux is that they're one of those perennial underachievers. When you think about the French league and you think about the names that you pull out, there's obviously Lyon, PSG, Monaco, Marseille, Bordeaux, and that next tier down, St Etienne as well. And they've got a coach in Jocelyn Gorvenac who divides opinion um, in the way he plays players. But this season he seems to have taken on that that kind of Leonardo Jardim approach of, well, if they're good enough, they're old enough. And you look at players like Adam Unas, who's 20. Um, the uh, the centre-forward position is Diego Roland, is only 24. Francois Camano is only 20. He's played 24 games. Uh, Thomas Touré, or Thomas Touré, 23 years of age. Laborde, who's been playing a lot of games recently, 22. Malcolm, brilliant uh, Brazilian name, love that, 20 years of age. They're all getting games. Um, and I think that that's kind of paid dividends to them in, in playing them. Um, another player who I really like, who's been linked with a move to Italy, actually, uh, this summer, John, you'll be interested to know, uh, Valentin Varda. Um, he's been linked with Lazio to replace Milinkovic Savic, potentially. He's an Argentine player. He's only 21 years of age. He's been absolutely brilliant for, for Bordeaux this season. So they've they've kind of blended this this philosophy of, of the old school approach of being hard to beat with suddenly finding goals. And, and Varda got two goals himself in this game, um, scoring a penalty on 50 and, and a second goal on 52. But it was that man, Malcolm. Um, he fired them one up, and and this is a, this is a big game for Mets as well. Make no mistake about it, Mets really could use the points. But um, Malcolm with a, a nice sort of curling drive into the near post, which uh, which put Mets on the back foot. Um, and then, as we say, we had the penalty. Questionable, I think it's fair to say. Malcolm was at the heart of it. Little bit of a physical tussle. I'm not sure it was a pen in truth, but it was given another lesson and and, uh, Varda tucked home rather comfortably. And then sadly it was a defensive mistake, a really clumsy mistake actually at the back for Mets, which cost them the third goal. Um, Good pressing, good hassling, uh, robbed at the back and then uh, ball slipped inside and Varda had the freedom of the penalty area to slot in the third goal. So it's a very, very good result this for Bordeaux. I'm not sure whether they'll have enough to catch Leon. I mean, it's still a five point gap. Um, I'd have to look up the fixtures, but I've got a funny feeling the two have got to play each other at some point in the running. Uh, frantically looking down my fixture list here. I'm going to be very silly if I'm wrong here. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they have played each other twice. But um, if you look at the run-ins specifically, I think Le- uh, Leon's running is a little bit tougher. Uh, away at Angers, away at Bastia, which should be easy, but Bastia fighting for their lives. Away at Montpellier and then home games against Nice and Nantes. Uh, whereas I think Bordeaux have probably got a slightly, slightly better run in. Yes, they've got Marseille and Saint Etienne in that in that gap, but they're at home to Marseille and they're at home to Bastia, uh, away to Saint Etienne, um, and then they finish with Lorient. That's obviously a, a guaranteed three points. So um, yeah, Bordeaux really impressed me. Um, they they really look uh, look like a side that could potentially qualify for Europa League, um, and with this win that um, pushes them back up into fifth with Marseille drawing. So good result. And as for Mets, yeah, fifteenth play, fifteenth place, uh, two straight defeats. They're okay. That they're, they're okay right now, but they've got to be very careful because as we'll come on to the next game, um, a couple of bad results can see you slide ever so slightly closer down to that relegation spot. 
Yeah, and a team that had been on a bad run but have uh, stopped the rot a little bit is uh, Montpellier. Um, luckily, they were against another team, Khan, who were uh, uh, probably the only team in worse form than them in the league. Um, a 2 0 win for them just to stabilise a little bit because they were sliding towards the bottom, weren't they? Yes, yeah. Um, this was actually a, a, a bigger game than than a lot of people thought. It was, it's one I watched um, on Saturday in between between Lorient. It's a huge result for Montpellier because I I said on the the, the um, uh, podcast I went on recently with the uh, Get French Football News guys, um, and they were all quite surprised when they said who was going down. And I actually picked Khan as, as one of the sides I still think will go down. And the main reason for that is that they they're very very one dimensional. Um, if if they don't they're one of these teams that they rely on on a select group of one or two or three players at max to get the results and if those players don't perform they're very very short um usually Ronnie Rodelan is is that man up front with the, he's kind of the goal scorer as is Santini and when those two are not firing um they really do struggle and they struggled again in this game and uh, it's a very very important three points like you say for Montpellier who are just on the slide recently um Montpellier's biggest problem is they get goals but they can't defend for Toffee so it's ironic that they managed to get a clean sheet in this game um but um yeah I I do I do worry for Khan um not too much because of course they're Danny's side and it has to be said they miss so many chances in this game how they didn't get a point from it is kind of beyond me to be perfectly honest but nevertheless they didn't get a didn't get any points from this game the um the performance overall, I think, for Montpellier is encouraging. Um, do you remember uh, the boys, um, Sessegnon? Oh, yes, Stefan uh, Sessegnon. Stefan yes. Sessegnon, yeah, yes, yeah. from West Brom. He's he's proved to be a very, very good signing. He got the opening goal just uh, just after half time, which kind of killed Khan, who were dominating at that point. And Ikone got the late goal. I think the performance, as much as anything else, will be a bonus for Montpellier because, as I say, they they've struggled for long periods um, in this in this season just to get any form of consistency. Um, they aren't out of the woods yet by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I would expect them to be safe. But as for Khan, is it three straight defeats for them now? And this is the time of the season where you start to go on that kind of run. In fact, they've lost four and five now. This is where they're really going to be looking over their shoulder. And when you've got Nancy and Lorient just a point behind them, and even and Dijon are only another two points back on them, Bastia only a point back from them, another couple of defeats Khan could could very very severe be in very severe problems. Uh, next three fixtures for Khan as well. Away at Metz, that's the sixth point I've ever seen one. Away at Nantes, uh, sorry, at home to Nantes, sorry, who've been resurgent, and at home to Marseille, who you just never know what you're going to get. So their running is far from easy, and I still think they're going to be one of the ones in the shake-up. It's very exciting down at the bottom. Uh, we will get to the table in a little bit. We'll just go through the other results. Um, a certain Mr. Balotelli was back in form for Nice, back in the team. A 2-1 win away at Lille. Uh, both goals from Mario there. We'll get a little bit on his celebration later on. Um, Anger put up a really good performance um, and managed to only lose 1-0 to Monaco. Um, Monaco, fair to say, got a little bit lucky in that game. I saw some of that and I thought Anger were probably worthy of a point. Uh, Did you see the coaching, by the way? Yes. <laughs> that was brilliant, wasn't it? Yeah, the, the coaching between, for those who haven't seen it, it's a viral video of um, Falcao and Moutinho, I think it was. Mm. Uh, or was it Bernardo Silva, one of the two, who were actively um, coaching the Monaco team from the sidelines, <laughs> encouraging Bakayoko to track back. So, yeah, quality stuff up. Yeah, um, but yeah, I thought, I thought Andre, were, Andre were decent in that game and maybe maybe worthy of a point. Nancy uh, uh, got a 3-0 win at home against Rent. A really good goal from uh, DR. Uh, oh. He got two, in fact, in this game, but a really lovely chip from him in this. Uh, we've already spoken about Bordeaux and the Lyon games. Uh, Bastia with a 2-1 win away against Dijon. Good result Huge. for them. Really, really needed that. Um, bottom two there fighting it out. Uh, Saint-Etienne got a 1-0 draw with Nantes um, and PSG a comfortable 4-0 win at home against Gangon uh, your friend Cavani with two <laughs> goals in that game um, we'll get to the table and everything in a little bit but we got a little bit of news uh, Monaco signing a new youngster a rising yeah. star yeah, it's not it's not official yet, but take it from me, it's official. Um, Yuri Tielemans, who um, I think somebody pointed out on our Twitter feed. I can't remember who it was actually. I'm sure it was one of our regulars. So apology, apologies. I think it was Tom actually, our good friend, uh, Five Star Flips. Um, Monaco have uh, agreed a deal in principle. It's all done by the shouting. Um, that Yuri Tielemans, who we we profiled on Hipster's Choice recently, and I remember us saying, who would he be a good fit for? 
Uh, yours truly said Monaco. I had no inside information at that point, I have to stress. But uh, yeah, it looks like that deal is done. Um, as I say, it's, it's not official, but it's pretty much done. They've they've done all the paperwork. They've agreed the um, the fee with, with uh, Anderlecht, and it's all done by the shouting. I think the only thing that will hold this deal up is where Bernardo Silva goes, because he's going to be the replacement. So very, very good sign in that for Monaco. Um, we did have one other bit of news which just amused me if you want this mm-hmm. one yeah. um, young Serge Aurier uh, he's a shrinking violet isn't he bless him um, he's uh, given an interview this week with Stade 2 which is uh, a, a publication in France where he simply says the following I am someone who is st- very strong mentally aside from that certain things have happened it continues to drag on because people want to talk about it maybe they want to destroy me I work I'm trying to remain faithful to myself for the moment, I'm a PSG player. I have a contract until 2019. So you can expect to see him rocking up in Barcelona anytime soon. <laughs> Very good. He's, he is something else, that lad. He really yeah. is. So much talent and such a prat. Um, the the Balotelli celebration, for anyone wondering, uh, he was a bit muted on the pitch, but on the uh, flight back um, from... Uh, who was it they were playing again? Uh, from Angers, yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, Leo, wasn't it? Uh, is it Lille? Oh yeah, sorry, Lille. Um, yes. Yeah, yes. sorry, from Lille to uh, to Nice. Uh, yeah, he did a nice knee slide straight through the metal detectors uh, that you walk through in the security in airport in the airport. So, um, have you, Mario can get away with it because he's a footballer. Um, I don't suggest us commoners <laughs> trying to think like that as no. airport security, especially these days. But um, we'll we'll get to the table now before uh, Chris gets ready with his game to watch for the weekend. Uh, Monaco are still top, seventy four points, just three points ahead of PSG. So so still neck and neck in that race, they're keeping it tight. Nice have now secured themselves champion leagues for next season, so really, really well done to them. They're uh, on 70 points, played a game extra than Monaco and PSG. Leon now 54 points in fourth place in that last uh, Europa League spot. Bordeaux up to fifth, now just five points off Leon. Uh, Marseille a further point behind them, and Sentetti on, on 45. So they're the last ones really chasing for Europe. Uh, Nantes on 42, Toulouse, Gangon both on 41, Aren on 40, Angers 39, Lille 37, Montpellier 36. And then from 15th down, well, it's really tight. Metz 35 points, Khan 32. Nancy 31, Lorion up to 18th, Chris is very happy, also on 31 points, Dijon on 29, and Bastia on 28. So, uh, yeah, there's like sort of five, six teams there really still battling out down at the bottom. Um, so still a lot to play for in Liga before the season is done. Uh, and what is your game to watch next week, Chris? Well, um, it's hard because there's a load of big ones. Um, Mets v Khan on Saturday night is huge for both mm. sides, as we've just discussed. Uh, nice versus Nancy is pretty big because both sides need the points there. Um, and Montpellier-Lorient is pretty big, given the fact that both are still in a bit of danger. Um, you could argue bastia Leon is also quite a big one. But I'm going to go with the, the, the standout fixture of the weekend, which is Sunday night, Olympic Marseille versus St Etienne. Uh, lots of bad blood between those two and uh, should make for quite interesting watching Sunday, 8 o'clock UK time. I think it will be on BT Sport. I would imagine so anyway. Cool. Uh, just very quickly, a uh, quick prediction for Monaco, Dortmund and for Lyon's chance against uh, Besiktas, isn't it, in the uh, Europa League? Yes. Um, Dortmund, Monaco, absolute mentalness, goals everywhere. <laughs> um, I can't see it any other way. I could be wrong. Both sides might be a bit more cagey because we're what we're at the quarterfinal stage now. Teams mm. tend to go a little bit more careful, don't they? They tend to be a little bit more um, subdued. But Monaco only know one way. Is it? It's in Dortmund, isn't it? The first leg. Yeah, it is away. Yeah, first uh, leg. Yeah, so I'd fully expect Monaco to go with the the four four two they've employed. I will expect them to attack Dortmund. Um, Drew would be, would be interesting to, to tweet and ask about this, but I can't see Dortmund keeping a clean sheet. Um, I think Dortmund will probably win the first leg, yeah. much like Manchester City did, but I think Monaco will have a very good chance going into the second. And as for Leon, they've got to beat Besiktas. This is, I mean, Besiktas are a good side, but um, Leon have got to be looking to go deep into this uh, into this tournament because realistically, winning it is the only way they're going to get the Champions League. So um, yeah. I would expect them to win, but I think they'll concede at home. And they, I think they're home, aren't they? First leg. So yes, I think so. Um, yeah, I'd go for a close, hard fought two one, uh, but it'll be very tough in Turkey in the second leg. Very good. Well, uh, that's everything from Liga for this week. Smash in, thank you. Right, uh, we'll waste no time and we'll go off to sunny Spain uh, for this week's chat about what's going on in La Liga. Right.
Right then, Joel. So we've uh, we've had um, a couple of biggies to talk about this weekend. Um, I actually managed to watch a few Spanish games this weekend. I know, shock horror. Uh, it does happen from time to time. But we're going to start with the Friday game, which I did not see, I must confess. Uh, Villarreal 3, Bilbao 1. Tell me about it. Yeah, um, this was the, the battle for the Europa League places, basically, uh, place. Um, it was a really good game, actually. It kind of showed that the quality of La Liga, because you drop out of the top four um, and there's still just so much quality within the league. And I think Villarreal and Bilbao kind of epitomised that. Um, contrasting styles of play. Um, Villarreal, almost a mini Atletico Madrid to me, kind of really compact, looked upon the counter-attack, whereas Bilbao, um, a bit more expansive and, and play kind of a high-intensity game where they, they look to kind of defend from the front high up. Um, and look to play kind of fast football um, with the pace that they've got as well. So this game kind of was a, was a really good game to watch. It, it, I couldn't have predicted that it was going to be 3-1 to Villarreal like it ended up. Um, Villarreal started the better side and, and, and went ahead with, through Victor Ruiz, who was later sent off, which I'll, I'll come to. Um, not long after, the, I'm Eric Laporte equalised for Bilbao, who... They've done really well to keep. He's a player I just thought certain would go to Manchester City under Guardiola. Um, I think there was definitely talks there. He, he chose to sign a new contract for Bilbao. So he's gone down the route of staying with the club and, and, and looking to develop his career whilst at the club. I don't know how long he'll stay, but um, he got the equaliser for Bilbao. Um, but then Villarreal kind of kind of pulled away. And, and um, Bakambu, who I rate highly um, for Villarreal, always a threat, pacey. Perfect for their style of play on the counter. Made it 2-1 and, and uh, Adrian Lopez put them 3-1 ahead. Um, at that point, Villarreal looked home and dry, but then Victor Ruiz was sent off, so he went kind of from hero to villain in the same game. Um, and, and Bilbao massively came back into it um, and Adrian Ruiz hit the bar twice. Um, but a really good game. But the, the end outcome for that is that Villarreal now six points clear of Bilbao and, and just too far off fourth position but they've kind of made fifth position their own if that makes sense um, so I, I think the bigger questions for, Bill, for Bilbao are already starting though I think that's one thing I saw come out of the game is where did Bilbao go from this point now I think Valverde will certainly leave obviously he was linked with the Barcelona job I don't think that's going to happen but I think his cycle at the club has ended um, there's been a couple of things that they're looking at and I don't know how far they'll get with this obviously they've got the Basque only policy that they operate um, whether they will look to um, change that um, I think to some resistance from supporters but I think others are seeing that the club will naturally get left behind as long as they have that policy um, and I think the other point which is really relevant is how complacent the players get playing for Athletic Bilbao when they can't go and sign the player quite quickly if you're aware in the first team, you're aware that there's not a good uh, player coming through the youth system or there's not a good other Basque-born um, player within the league who Bilbao can look to bring in, then I don't I see where there's motivation. I think that's been levelled at the board of Bilbao that this is promoting kind of complacency with, with the team. So I think it's a big summer for Bilbao. Certainly the new manager, I think they're looking to promote from within. Um, when Valverde does go, if, if he goes. Um, so I think... He, he, um, I think they've already got their eye on, on um, next season for certain. I think for Villarreal, it's a really good result. And I think it, it cements what they've basically done this year, which is another good season. I think they've been aiming for the top four, but I think losing Marcelino so early, well, before they even kicked the ball, was not the ideal start. And Escobar's gone in there and done really well. Um, so positive for Villarreal in the end of the weekend. Studied the ship, haven't they? Um, two very quick questions that I have to ask on Bill Bell. Um, yeah. One, will they lose Imeric Laporte this summer? Because it's been just going on and on forever, this one. Um, and secondly, it's, and it's a bit of a weird question, but w is there ever going to be a day where the policy will be forced to change on the acquisition of Basconi players? And I say that purely as, um, yes, I'm sure there will always be Basque players, but will there always be Basque players that are good enough at this level? I think that's the. I think first, the second question first. I think that's the point. Um, I don't know how, if there will be force. You kind of think they've done so well up to now, and you, you kind of reflect on it and think, God, they do so well when they've got to kind of European um, late in the stages of Europa League, and they've done well uh, when there's under Bielsa, and they think you've, they've got to Spanish Cup finals and won the Spanish Cup, and you think the policy of just only selecting from that region. Um, 
the, I don't think the well's dry. I just don't know if they've got enough quality um, when it comes to developing a squad. And I think some of the replacements they've brought in this season have not been up to the standard required. So I think they potentially could be forced to do it. But I think it's, it would go against the grain of what the club stands for. Um, but it's that basis of how far do they want to push it. And, and if they do want to push it through, would they get enough support to do it? Because um, it would be kind of, a, you know, in, in some terms, a constitutional change for the club. Um, on Laporte, I think he'll stay this summer because he did sign a new Whopper deal um, last summer after the interest from Manchester City. So I think he'll stay for this summer. It's inevitable he's going to leave at some point. Um, and like I say, I was really surprised that he chose to stay um, last summer. But he's, um, he's a fantastic player. And I think, what is he? Is he, is he 22, 23? Not even that. So I think he's got such a long career ahead of him. He's probably, you know, maybe become an icon at Bilbao and then look to move on. Mm, he's a very, very good player, isn't he? Very decent, very highly rated. But uh, yes, we shall see whether he does switch on to another club or not. I think I'm with you. I'd rather see him stay for now. Um, on to the Madrid derby then. This was probably the game that everybody, uh, well, they either did know it was going on or they didn't because of these bizarre TV rights uh, that we mentioned last week. But uh, ended in a 1-1 draw. Um, who does this this result benefit the most? We'll come on to Barcelona in a minute because that has to come into the conversation. But does it does it benefit um, either club or is it a result that both clubs will go, well, that was a bit meh? I think if you'd have asked Real Madrid at full time, would they happy with it? They'd have said completely no on the basis that Barcelona were going to Malaga. I think if you've asked Madrid after Barcelona had finished and lost, they'd have 100% yeah, it's a good result because it's probably the toughest game out of the running now gone. They didn't lose and they've gained a point. Um, for Atletico Madrid, I think they'd have been happy with it. They've got no, I say, no chance to win the league. It'd take a miracle for them to win the league. They played well, um, defended really well. Um, so I think now at this point, both would be happy with the outcome of the game. Um, Madrid, Madrid kind of epitomised the way they've been playing for a number of weeks and probably all season, where they don't don't particularly play well, but they just do enough in the right places. And I think that's the way the Zidane era has been defined. It's not sparkling, it's not polished. It's just really efficient and effective. Um, and I think they are getting to that point where they are just kind of becoming a bit machine-like. And they started, as I said, they started the better side on on, on Saturday. But Atleti was very happy for Madrid to Madrid to play into their own hands, if that makes sense. So they, they, they played the classic style. They sat in, they defended deep. And they played really narrow. They looked for the counter-attack through Griezmann whenever they could in Torres. Um, it was a classic performance of Atletico Madrid. Um, Madrid had kind of one chance. Real Madrid had one chance in the first half. You know, Ronaldo went through and uh, not to past Oblak and Savic cleared off the line. But I think at half-time, Atletico Madrid would have been satisfied with it. In the second half, Real Madrid did come out the better side. Um, and um, they, they took the lead through Pepe um, with, with a set piece goal. So it wasn't Ramos for once, it was Pepe, um, who then incidentally went off in the second half with two broken ribs. So he just got back in the team in Varane's absence and now he's out for probably six or seven weeks. So he's going to miss the, the running of the season. Um, but they, they went through the head through um, through Pepe, um, and the game kind of you felt would peter out at that point. Atletico Madrid tried and tried to, to do something, but couldn't generate anything up ahead of steam. But then got the equaliser five minutes from time through Griezmann, and um, with a really really good finish. Um, and then and obviously Real Madrid responded at that point, but it, it was not enough. Um, I think the bigger picture for, for Real Madrid is they look good for the title now. I think they're, they've got. Not one hand on it, but they're in an absolute driving seat. They've still not got the Bale, Benzema and Cristiano dynamic working at the minute. They're not all kind of on the same hymn sheet or playing well collectively, but they're getting through games. And I think that that's what's really important for them now. And I don't think they'll mind too much if they can just eat the way um, through it now. Um, and, the, and, the, and at the minute, they're not having to do too much to win the league. You know, speaking from a Barcelona perspective, it's kind of been handed to them at the minute, um, which is difficult for me to say. But it, it just feels like they're on that road to the to the league. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the league doesn't lie and they are, they are top for a reason. Um, I do kind of feel like they'll breathe a sigh of relief after drawing and then Barca um, not winning. Um, and now I think they've just got the, a, truth, a tough trip to Vigo 
um, towards the end of the season. I think that's match in between match 37 and 38, which would have been a really tough game to go and win the league there, but they might not have to do that now. Um, for Atleti, I think they, they can take so many positives from the performance on Saturday. They were they were really, really good. And as I said last week, they're, they're back to what they're good at and um, they're back to being what made them successful. And I think Saturday proved it. Um, so, all in all, a draw is probably a fair result. Although Madrid shaded it before um, they scored and, and slightly afterwards. But then, um, yeah, so I think a draw is a fair result. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I did watch that um, in and out and it did seem like a overall draw was a, a decent result. Good finish from uh, Mr. Griezmann as well. Very good take that one. Um, so that leads us nicely on to Barcelona then, who went to Malaga um, traditionally, not a place that they uh, particularly do well at, um, certainly in recent results. Um, and they had a rather off night, I think it's fair to say. Um, certainly one Brazilian definitely had an off night and Malaga ran out 1-0 winners. Could have been more, couldn't it? 2-0, Chris, actually. Sorry, you're right. 2-0. I only saw one goal. I turned <laughs> yeah, off the other goal. Sorry. I've, I've, just, well. I've taken the goal <laughs> off from them. <laughs> um, yeah, so going into the game, obviously the Madrid game was at 3, 15-hour time, and this was at quarter to 8. So you kind of felt this was the perfect opportunity to kind of for Barca to put the league back in their own hands. And it was. If they'd beat Malaga and they go and win the Clasico, they were on for the league. Um and Luis Enrique chose to rotate heavily. Um, I can understand that because they've got eight games in April. So um, I don't think the um, rotations were the issue. Um, oh, sorry, they were the issue, but I don't blame Luis Enrique for doing them. Um, I think he was merited in doing it. And I, and I saw a lot on social media over the weekend blaming Enrique for it. But I think if he can't play, Jerry Matthew cost close to €30 million. Euros. Andre Gomez, who cost €40 million. Euros then they shouldn't be at the club and they shouldn't be playing for Barcelona. So I think to, to level at Enrique's door is, is a bit harsh. They were really poor. Um, they went back to a 4-3-3 um, to move away from the 4-3-3. I think to largely to accommodate Jordi Alba, which is odd that they move the team around to fit in a left full-back, but he's really important and he doesn't really fit into a 3-4-3. He went with Matthew and Mascarano as a two and a half, and that just didn't work. Um, Matthew just looked so out of his depth. Um, they had a chance early on with Suarez, um, which um, is a good save by Carlos Kameni, who has always has a great game against Barcelona, no matter who he's playing for, Espanyol or now Malaga just seems to play well. And you kind of thought this, this could be one of those nights. Um, Malaga took the lead through um, Sandro Ramirez, who's ex Barca, let him go on a free in the summer. Matteo did a really strange thing, I don't know if anyone's seen it, um, it but he tried to play offside. Um, in, in Malaga's half, which is just bizarre. So Sandro on the on the kind of break went through one on one and slotted it past to Stegen. He did over celebrate and I did think it was a bit odd considering he he kind of come through the Messiah. Um and he did over celebrate and I think Suarez had a word with him at half time to some quote was on the internet around um word to the effect of don't bite the hands that's fed you. But he did score and they did let him go on a free. So I think he was within some reason celebrate but he did go quite over the top. Um Barca made two changes at half time and they brought on um, Iniesta um, and Sergio Roberto and changed the system and brought off Matthew and Gomez. Um, they looked like they were getting back into the game. Messi had a couple of chances. Messi was at the kind of the forefront of everything they were doing. Um, in the first half, Neymar had got a strange first yellow card for. He's got this thing with his boots and it's been mentioned a lot. And I don't know how much he's in this, but he does change his boots in the game, um, which is. Um, quite often, pr- practically every game, there's some accusation that it's because then um, his boot manufacturer, i.e. Nike, get his boots on the TV because obviously they will, the editor will cut to him changing his boots. He then, in the game against Malaga, tried to tie his lace to stop a free kick being taken. I think he was just trying to stop a quick free kick being taken. The referee um, booked him for it. Um, and then obviously he carried that into the second half. He had a really off night, Neymar. I think we'd spoken a couple of weeks ago how could he'd been, how he'd been a catalyst against PSG. He just had one of those nights where everything didn't go right, and he um, looked really frustrated, and then he ended up um, picking up a second booking um, about the 60th minute. It was a bad challenge, basically. It was definitely a yellow card, and it was fully merited for him to be sent off. Um Barcelona then pushed forward, obviously, trying to trying to get an equaliser. Roberto had a really good chance, but Malaga looked decent. And then they hit Barcelona on the break and got the second on the 90th minute. So I think the the, 
the few outputs from this game is that the league's practically over for Barcelona. They're going to certainly focus on the Champions League now, and that's certainly something they're going to try and do. They're clearly not out of it. They can win the league still, but you, can you expect Madrid to, to slip up at this point? I just can't see it. Um, Enrique's obviously got the stick for the, the rotations that he made. Um, I think his, his fingers have been pointed at certain players who've not done well, i.e. Andre Gomez and Denis Suarez. have just not When they've come in, they've just not been at level required. And I think Enrique is then at a point where he can't trust his squad, which is never a, a good situation for Magic to be in. And I think on over the weekend, there was also a lot of... Um, Kind of criticism of Neymar um, that he, you know, he he, he he does this all the time, and he, he needs stopping, and he's not good enough to lead the club. And, you know, I did look at that, and it was his first red card he'd had while he's been there in three and a half seasons. So I think it's a bit harsh to blame Neymar. He was frustrated. It was stupid. Um, I don't think he's costing the league because I think we were one 0 down and not playing particularly well anyway. Um, and people are saying he's not got the mantle now to take it on from Messi because his temperament's not right. But again, like we spoke about on the on the pod a couple of weeks ago last week, Messi just got a four game suspension for um, criticising an assistant referee. So if you can't, the, the two don't work. You know, against um, you can't level that against Neymar, not against Messi. That he can't be leader of the club either. So I think it's a bit over the top on Neymar. Um, he is kind of the future of the club, and I think they need to kind of stick with him. Um, it is disappointing, and 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 I think the worst thing for the Neymar situation is that from a Barcelona perspective, not only did he get the um, two yellows, which is a, a one-game suspension. So he would have missed the Sociedad game next week and back for the Clasico. He sarcastically applauded the fourth official slash referees. He went off. So he's been hit with another two or three games. And that'll be confirmed tomorrow. So he's practically out of the, the running now anyway. Um, so he'll definitely miss the Clasico. So it it kind of went from about 7.44 when they kicked off that they can go and win the league and they could be on for the treble to um, definitely out of the league at the up full time. And um the season doesn't look great from a lower league perspective, so they can potentially look to just focus on the Champions League. Silly boy, silly boy for that sending off. And um, that that Classico suddenly becomes um, very, very important if they're to stay in it. One other very quick question I have to ask you, a um, bit of a random one, and it might sound really, really stupid. Another stupid question, but are Barcelona suffering um, by building their whole team around the fact that Neymar, Suarez and, ne- and Messi have to start. What I mean by that is, is there an over-reliance in that area of the field where the midfield's been a bit not quite at it all season? Over-reliance in sense that they're fatigued or just the way they bit, play? Bit of both, bit of both. The system's built for them, isn't it? And as you say, they have they are required to play all these games. I'm just wondering if yeah. it's a, a bit overkill and dare I say, can be a bit predictable. I mean, I know they're world-class players, but when you know how they're going to play, you can set up to, to counter-attack it. Yeah, I, I think the, the whole time Luis Enrique has been there, this has been the whole um, debate that's gone on between him and, and, and Guardiola. And I think it's, even if he was to win the treble this season, he still wouldn't be as revered as Guardiola is because of the style of play. I think he has built the team around the, the front three. Um, he'd never never comments on it when he gets criticised about it. I think if I was him, I'd level back to say, well, I'm doing the, the probably the three best players, so therefore I need to build the team around them. The, the, the Spanish, uh, sorry, the Barcelona fans want a possession-based game. He's not that fussed about the possession-based game. He prefers a direct style of football, i.e. get the ball to those three, get get them and get the ball as quickly forward as possible. Therefore, you create one-on-ones. You know, you, he basically his argument is you want Messi, you want Neymar in a one-on-one situation against a fullback or a centre half, and you want Suarez not to be occupied by three or four defenders. He sees the possession game as a way of a team to get numbers back and defend, which invariably does happen anyway. But like you say, the, the counter attack is something that has killed them for so many years. Under Guardiola, it was also an issue, and um, it is something that um teams have, have worked out and have, have realized that if they just gamble slightly on the counter attack they are there and they can be exposed i actually don't think there's a solution to that from a barcelona perspective I, says, I guess the solution is don't lose the ball in in their half and if you do lose it make sure you've got some element of cover but that's quite straightforward so um in terms of the, them being kind of fatigued um i think it's so difficult to leave out those three players um if you leave one of them out for um, he, he certainly can't drop Messi. Um, he, he's been proven that it's just the wrong thing to do. I think well, the great comment about Guardiola was how do you manage Messi? And he said two things. One, um, never drop him. 
and two, if he sulks, just leave him be and he'll come back when he's ready. So I think that says everything the way to manage Messi. Same with Neymar, I think it'd be difficult to leave him out and Suarez wants to score and play in every single game. So it's a brave manager who decides to leave them out and they are so close and you kind of feel if you lose one, you lose the three. So I think the easiest thing to do is play them in every single game, although that's probably not the best thing to do. Um, but that said, just before the game on Saturday, the talk was how well Barcelona are now set up to approach the last two months of the season. So it's amazing what one game can do. It is, uh, it is one of those that the, the debate rages on, of course. But nevertheless, as you say, a disappointing day at the office for Barca, who will have their uh, attentions probably on the Champions League, no doubt. Um, I'll just quickly rattle through these other results, because I know there's a little bit of news to get to as well. So um, on the Saturday, uh, Espanyol with a 1-0 win over Deportivo Alaves. Piatti with the winning goal in that one. Sevilla back to winning ways, 4-2 over Deportivo. Bit of a thrill of that. Gail Kakuta scoring twice for Deportivo. Um, Goals uh, for Jovetic, Sanabria, Correa and Ben Yedda for Sevilla. Uh, Valencia won a, won a game. Wow, I know. Who'd have thought? Uh, Simone Zatza, more on him in a second with two. Uh, Santi Mina with one. And uh, the brilliantly named Ponce, or, or Ponce, if you prefer Ponce, but no, Ponce. Uh, for Granada, pulling one back wasn't enough. Ibar win again. They just keep going. 2 0 away at Celta Vigo, Kike and Pedro Leon. Uh, Osasuna, um, I think. Well, let's be honest, they're still doomed, but they did win a game. Hurrah! 2 1 against Lagones. Uh, Sivas putting them in front. The away side, that is Sergio, Sergio Leon with uh, a penalty and a winner on 71. And Las Palmas battering Betis last night 4 1. Vincente Gomez, uh, Kevin Prince, Boateng, Jonathan Vieira, and Hesse uh, scoring the goals there. Uh, Rafa Navarro pulling one back for Betis. Uh, Sociedad play Sporting Gijon this evening. Uh, so we've got a bit of news. Simone Zasa is a permanent deal to Valencia. How much is that going to be? Uh, 20 million euros. They've done really well there. Uh, yes. I thought he'd scored more than four in 14. I looked it up today. But um, yeah, he seems to have found um, somewhere for him to play his football after the West Ham debacle. So it's a good move yeah. for him to move for Valencia. So they love a centre forward. Um, so he's perfect for them. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, also, some news um, with regards to Monchi. Uh, we, we know his uh, his mm. movements in the summer now, it seems. Well, kind of. We know he's definitely going. Um, what was unbelievable on Saturday is they had kind of a, a presentation for him. Um, on the, he's, he's kind of revealed his, the, the, the biggest club legend ever, which he is. When you look at the plays that he's brought through, he's been there so long, you know, your Alex Vidal's, your Condogbys, your Negredo's back, because it's just unbelievable what he's done now, Danny Alves. Um, they had a kind of a, it was an amazing video was going around on, on Twitter at the weekend where there was something like two and a half thousand supporters in the outside the stadium with, with banners for him and, and they gave him some kind of a, a presentation informally, then they did a full presentation in the stadium for him and they brought out all the trophies that they'd won under. Kind of, it's like he's the, been the manager of the team, although he's just been a director of football, but he's done such an amazing job that He's leaving at the right time. He leaves an absolute legend for the club. And I think it's unique to see such a director of football revered so highly as he is. Um, and I think it's a role that you don't particularly see in England. So um, it's a big feature of, of European football for certain. And, and I think he's probably the best around. Mm, yeah, he's, he's certainly one that everybody seems to be uh, seems to be after. Um, and also kind of other bits of news. Uh, Tony Adams, uh, manager of Granada. OK, mm. then. Um, that was made official today. That's to the end of the season, am I right in saying? Yeah, just it's just bizarre. So he's been there in an advisory role and a director of football role for the last three or four months. He worked with the owner of Granada, who's a Chinese owner um, ah. in, in China. So there is the link there. So he was advising on, on the Chinese Super League team, which name escapes me. Um, so there's, a, there's definitely a fit. Obviously, they sacked Alcaraz for the third time Granada at the weekend it's the third time which is quite common in Spain for managers to go and come back quite a lot of times but he went after the defeat at the weekend um, I don't think anybody saw them bringing Tony Adams in um, to the end of the season I don't know if they've looked at his record in England but I don't particular. think so <laughs> <laughs> one particular good I think I spoke a couple of weeks ago about Granada that they're a team that lack identity they've got so many lone players I think I saw I did see a quote from Tony Adams a couple of weeks back where he said they've got something like 106 players um, and of which something like 40 are at the club and the rest are out on loan. Um, but then they also get loans themselves. So it's a strange setup with the, the kind of the remnants of the Pozzo regime there, obviously linked with Watford and, and Udinese. So they're trying to sort the club out. I just don't know if that's the right fit for Tony Adams. I think also 
Um, you know, I don't know. I just find it a, a bizarre decision, but it's clearly temporary. I think they're down the seven points from safety. Be a miracle if he keeps them up. Um, but I don't think he'll be there next season. Yeah. In in the role. No, no, agreed. Um, and final bit of news before I give the uh, lovely ladies and gentlemen the table. Um, really bad news for Giuseppe Rossi. A third cruciate ligament injury. Yeah, it's just, it's just, just got no luck. And um, he just, I think when we were recording last week, he scored a hat trick against Las Palmas for Celta. Um, so he kind of got himself in the team. He'd been playing a bit because they were obviously resting and rotating for the Europa League. So he was playing a bit in the league. We've got four and 16, and he was starting to look sharp again. Um, so he's out for another six or seven months now. So it's just really bad luck the third time he's done it, and you just wonder how many times can he keep doing this and keep coming back he must be really strong mentally that's all I can think to keep doing it mm, yeah agreed it's just really really tough on the lad okay um let's give everybody the table and then you can give us a game to watch next week so Real Madrid are still top of the table 72 points from their 30 played uh, one game more than Barcelona so obviously if they win that game it could go level uh 69 points for Barca Atletico Madrid 62 points in third uh, they're in the Champions League spots. Uh, Sevilla, 61 from their 31. So still a race between those two. Villarreal, fifth. Uh, Ibar up to sixth. Amazing. Three straight wins. 54 points in fifth. Uh, in sixth, sorry. Uh, Athletic Bilbao, Sociedad, Espanyol, Vigo make up the top ten. Of course, Sociedad uh, could go as high as ooh, sixth with a win tonight, depending on results there. Um, Alaves, 11th. Valencia up to 12th. Uh, almost certainly safe now uh, with uh, Las Palmas uh, up to 13th with their win Malaga up to 14th with their win Betis slipping to 15th uh, Deportivo La Coruña Legones and Sporting Gijon um, are down in 16th 17th and 18th uh, Sporting still just about within a sniff maybe of uh, catching Legones uh, Granada Still looking doomed, as Joel says, at 20 points. And Osasuna, uh, despite two straight wins, yes, not one, but two straight wins, uh, still think they're probably doomed at the bottom on 17 points. So what's, uh, which game are we looking out for next week then, Joel? Um, it's a really weird weekend next week. And it's not a game that jumps out. There's kind of a, a lot of just is not consequential game. The one I will pick out, though, is Valencia Sevilla, which is kind of, an, you think back to the old days, Valencia being good, but they are in a good form now. Um, so that's on Sunday, uh, English time, 3.15, and it'll be on Sky. So I think that'll be a good game. Just just really quickly on Valencia, um, they would be in the Champions League places um, if the league started in Jan- on January the 1st, 2017. So they are doing really well since the turn of the year under Voro. So it's one to look out for next weekend. Voro mm, in. Uh, yes, indeed. OK, so that's one to look out for. And uh, we'll be back to you, Joel, with uh, a couple of... Oh, we've got a question in that certainly ties into yourself. So we'll be back with the questions shortly. Good stuff. Right. Um, we're off to Italy next to have a little chat with John. Uh, it's been a busy week and lots of goals. It's this week's area. Right then, John, we're going to start with Juve. Um, we, we generally start with Juve, don't we? But we're, we're no, no change this week. Um, they got a fairly routine victory at home to Kievo, um, but it's been more talk about this, uh, this delightful link-up between um, Messas uh, Iguain and uh, Paolo Dybala. Um, so tell us a little bit, of the, a bit about the game. And also, uh, I have a question. Um, if big money came in for Dybala in the summer, do you think he would still be around? Ooh, uh, that is a good question. Reports are that he's signing a new deal um, sometime in the coming weeks, and I think it's going to tie him down till 2021. I think something like that. Uh, that's that's the talk of the contracts. So that'll be a big wage improvement. But yeah, there's obviously a lot of talk about Iguain and Dybala because uh, the Barcelona game coming up. Barca have MSN, uh, Juve now apparently have HD. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> the stupid names people come up with. Um, really bad, isn't it? Yeah, um, it, it was no surprise, you know, Juventus uh, winning this game uh, 2-0 at home against Chievo, who were obviously on a run of really bad form. Juve obviously lost their last game, but they were always going to bounce back here. They brought in some rotation here. Storaro was starting. Marquisio, who is a fantastic player, but is still coming back from that injury that he had that's seen him out for a long term. Uh, he's back in. Regani as well in defence. But yeah, it was the Dybala show. He was just unbelievable in this game again. Um, 
you know, yeah, there's going to be space against a team like Kievo, but the the performance he put in, the link up play, um, him and Quadrado, some of the no look passes, the nutmeg through ball first time outside of the boot pass, that you know, it's just string every superlative and and word together that you can. Um, and Higuain, who had been in somewhat of a dry patch, uh, at least for him in terms of uh, scoring goals, um, getting two in this particular game. Uh, yeah, this they seem to be telepathic. They really do. Um, it's interesting with you know Joel's mentioned before about Argentina and sort of Messi and how the focus is all on him and they can't quite get that team to work. And sometimes you think, well, if you just take him out of the firing line, you've got two guys who you could just put in place, who already play together, uh, who have a brilliant understanding, and surely that brings the team a little bit more cohesion. But, you know, Messi's just too big a name to drop, I suppose. Um, But it was the perfect warm-up for the Champions League coming up. Um, You know, Barca game is going to be absolutely huge. It's the tie I'm really looking forward to seeing. Uh, You know, they managed to rest Chiellini. Dani Alves came on late in the game as well. I expect him to start. Bonucci as well came on late. I'd expect him to start in the game. So, uh, yeah, really exciting things. And just keeps Juve ticking along nicely at the top of the table, um, keeping them out of uh, touch of uh, Roma and Napoli. And, uh, yeah, all eyes will be on the uh, the Barca game this midweek. As for Dybala leaving, no. I I, I do think he's going to sign a new deal. you know, that I think a club would have to come in with a. It's going to be a hundred million plus because just the way he's playing at the moment, he's got to be right up there. You know, he's not far off uh, being sort of lauded in terms that Messi and Neymar and the rest of them are. Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's one of those, isn't it? I wonder if if just their resolve was tested with a big bid, but um, yeah, I guess we shall have to see the answer to that in the summer. I do, um, um, I do expect at some point further down the line, I could see him certainly in a Barcelona shirt. I was um, thinking the yeah, exact same yeah. thing. He, yeah, or, I mean, or he, yeah, he 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 fits perfectly. He's just a wonderful footballer. He's so, he's so brilliant to watch. And uh, you know, if if Barca, you know, if the fans do turn on Neymar for whatever reason, which I think would be ludicrous to be perfectly honest, like Joe, I think it's a bit yeah. harsh the criticism he's getting. Um, he's he's done brilliant in the three seasons he's been there. But yeah, Dybala would be, uh, I suppose, a natural heir to Messi being Argentinian as well. Um, just brilliantly gifted with both feet and uh, unbelievable talent. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. Okay, on to AC Milan, though. Uh, no takeover, but they did batter Palermo uh, 4-0. Um, we got some news on Palermo. You can work that into this roundup if you like. But Milan looking impressive and uh, a goal um, with the, an expectant father in Gerard De Feu later on as well. And a very good day for an ex-Liverpool player to boot. Yeah, a uh, really good performance. Again, a game where you, you kind of expected this result. Uh, Milan's form has been a bit, little bit hit and miss lately, but they got the game off perfectly. Suso, the ex-Liverpool player, who's had a really good season, um, scored a wonderful free kick early on. Uh, excuse me. Um, from the uh, right-hand side, just into the top-hand corner, really really good finish. Uh, Pasalic getting the, the second uh, assist from Suso as well, just bundled in at the back stick. And uh, Backer made it 3-0 before half-time. Um, and it was a really, really good performance for Milan. Um, the deal was supposedly going to be announced and all pushed through today, but uh, nothing has happened as of yet. So, again, we'll, we'll keep waiting. Um, Dea Lefeu, as you say, I think his wife's still expecting. It's, it's supposed to be any any day now. Uh, but, yeah, he got a really, really good goal at the end uh, of the game there, just uh, running down the left-hand wing, beating a couple of players and then cutting inside and curling it into the bottom corner. He's been really, really good since he's moved there. Uh, he wants to make the move permanent, by the sounds of it. Um, really enjoying his time in Milan. And Montella as well. looks like he's going to get a new contract. Uh, he's done a really good job with, with those group of players. He's managed to get uh, back a scoring again. He's got lots of young talent there. He's brought in Lapadula as well, who's done really well, considering he's a Serie B player. Um, and all of a sudden, Milan, who were you know were the lesser of the two in the city, um, which I was very pleased about, obviously, as an Inter fan, have suddenly jumped ahead of Inter um, and now have got a real chance uh, of being in the Europa League next season, which... Um, you know, considering the sort of mess that the the club has been in, the way the the board have been running it, the executives, the constant, oh, they're going to be taken over, are they not? Uh, rumours. Um, you know, they're doing really, really well. And if they can get European football next season, it's going to be a huge, 
huge boon for the club, um, especially if the takeover does go through, because then they'll have uh, some serious money to spend as well. But I hope they stick with this sort of the youth project they've got going and the you know lots of young Italian players, because it's it's really making the San Siro rock again and and bringing back people to the stadium. Um, as for Palermo, oh, it just dreadful. Uh, you know the the new owners come in. Uh, the American guy uh, just hasn't really worked out. Looks like Diego Lopez is probably going to get sacked, which is not the biggest surprise ever, obviously, because it's Palermo. It's just what happens. Um, but there's also talk that the uh, the sporting director uh, may also uh, quit and, and leave his job. So um, it's it's really not going well there. Uh, I don't know who's going to come in to replace Lopez. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if one of the other coaches comes back in. Um, who that would be, I really don't know. I think a few of them are still on the books, um, as they do in Italy. But, yeah, Palermo looked kind of lost. That We co- we gave them a small glimmer of hope, didn't we, that, that maybe they'd get themselves out of the relegation fight. But it just hasn't worked. They haven't taken the chances that they've been offered um, and sort of given up to them. And, uh, actually, it's another team now that, really surprisingly, might get themselves out of relegation, but we'll come to them a bit later. So... Uh, Palermo looked doomed, new owner, uh, hasn't done anything, uh, and as for Milan, things are looking on the up, and uh, I kind of, even though I am an Inter fan, I kind of hope they do get back into Europe, because um, it'll be nice to see a, a big Italian name back in Europe where it should be. Yeah, back at Europe's top table, and it'd be nice to see him make some some top quality signings to go with those youngsters as well. Um, the Sunday night game, now this was... Um, <sighs> Was it a surprise? I don't know. Maybe the manner of the defeat for Lazio was a surprise. They hosted Napoli. Um, I, I'm really not sure about these Napoli kits. I know Kappa <laughs> like a tight kit, but that, it's just, they just look spray on. Um, and is it black or is it dark brown? I'm not sure. But anyway, whatever the kit was, um, Lazio uh, were defeated at home 3-0 uh, by Napoli. Uh, richly deserved as well, wasn't it? I mean, Napoli were the better side for long spells and and uh, came out with three points. But is is it a big result for Napoli in terms of Champions League, or was it the expected result overall? Um, I don't think it was expected. The, uh, Napoli, I think, probably were giving the edge just because of the injuries that uh, Lazio had leading up to the game. Uh, they lost a lot of their back line. Uh, Wesley Hoyt wasn't fit enough to start the game. Uh, De Fry was injured and he couldn't play. So they were missing a lot of their key defenders. Um, but in terms of going forwards, they still had a pretty solid uh, forward line. They still had Milinkovic Savic, they still had Anderson and Immobile. And they created a few chances, Lazio, but they were very much uh, the pragmatic team, which is what something that uh, Simone Inzaghi has actually brought into them is be defensive and solid first, which is not something we've seen from Lazio for a while, and then build from that, break a pace, and they've obviously got those players. Uh, but Napoli were just a class above again, and they're, they're just one of the best teams to watch, um, not just in Italy, but all around Europe. They're, they're great. They're, the front line, the goals they score, uh, Hamsik, Mertens, Callahan, Insigne, uh, all brilliant to watch. Um, when you think how well um, you know Milik had done when he came to the club, and he obviously got that horrible injury, he's now back and he still can't get in the team. Dries Mertens, who has never played as a striker before in his life, and the amount of goals he's got this season, uh, you know, shooting for Capo Calanieri. Um, I'd love to know how many goals Jose Callahan has scored from sort of two yards away at the back stick um, since he's been at Napoli because it seems to be all he's done. Uh, that's what he did for the first one. A brilliant ball across from Hamsik as usual. Lovely, lovely Napoli move. And they just picked Lazio apart. Really impressive. And it was a very big result because Lazio were starting to chase them down. And if they'd won that, they would have only been a point behind Napoli and been pushing for the Champions League. And Napoli kind of lost the the edge a little bit in terms of chasing after Juve with Roma uh, jumping above them so uh, Napoli really needed to win this game and put down a marker and they did that they they lost uh, or sorry they'd won earlier in the week against Juventus but ultimately gone out in the Coppa Italia in the semi final they did win three two and it was a very good performance so I think that buoyed them a little bit Lazio meanwhile had lost to Roma but again had gone through on aggregate. Uh, over Roma, so Lazio, Juve will be the final for the Coppa Italia. So um, it's kind of mixed, mixed bag in terms of the weeks for both clubs. But I think Lazio will still be really pleased um, with the season the way it's gone. Um, and Inzaghi, another manager who's done really, really well, kind of unheralded, come through the youth setup. Um, you know, kind of in his uh, brother's shadow, uh, shadow. And um, 
taking this Lazio team on and again uh, a guy who at the moment looks like he's going to be get offered a, another contract uh, stay at Lazio so um, building on the good work that Pioli had done there the season before but uh, yeah disappointing result for him but huge for Napoli because it just gives them a little bit more of a buffer for the Champions League which they uh, really need year in year out yeah yeah absolutely yeah it's a very very good performance overall for Napoli and like you say they're enjoyable to watch I think that's the uh that's the most important thing when you when you look over it okay um so uh that uh, we, we can't uh, we, uh, we've just about got enough time I think so we can't leave Inter out of this conversation um <laughs> what, I mean what happened Crotone I mean really I mean, they're giving themselves a real chance aren't they that's two on the spin um, yeah, they beat Kiev, and you go, okay, that sort of expected. But to beat Inter at home, I mean, that's a hell of a performance. And, and one of the, I think it's the second goal. That was stunning. Yeah, um, Falcinelli's done really, really well um, for for Crotone. He scored some great goals for them. But uh, yeah, just Inter just had completely the wrong attitude in the game. They were so lack and slow. They weren't pressuring. Uh, they weren't pushing high up the pitch like they had been in other games. And uh, Crotone, who I've all of a sudden turned around and just decided, you know what, everyone's written us off. Um, we, we're really going to go for this. And they're doing it. Uh, there's calls now for Falcinelli to maybe be called up to the Italy team because, you know, he's scoring goals in a really poor team. Um, I think he's got over 10 in that awful Crotone team. And let's be honest, it is pretty bad, which is kind of ridiculous um, to see that. And it's got some really, really good goals as well. Uh, Crotone, you know, they, they tried to fire their manager and no one wanted the job. No one would go there. So they had to stick with him, um, <laughs> which is, you know, it's kind of a weird thing now because they're like, yeah, we're going to back him. We're going to uh, back Davide Nicola. Um, so it's a great result for them. As for Inter, it, it's just dreadful. Their season's kind of crumbled apart now because that basically writes off. I mean, mathematically, yes, Champions League is still possible, but it's just not going to happen. And what's worse now is that they may not even get Europa League, and it's still going to be difficult to attract players if you don't have top European football. Um, they've got a lot of money, and they will spend a lot in the summer, no doubt about that. But again, it gives these question marks over Pioli, which I think is a little bit harsh because he's still got issues in that squad there's still things that need to be changed there the defense definitely needs work and there could still be some improvement i think in the uh sort of other other options to icardi because he is kind of hung out to dry on his own up front if he doesn't get the goals no one else really does um so i feel a little bit bad for pioli but there's a lot of names being bounded around again uh sam Paoli is one uh from Sevilla. uh the conti rumor still won't go away despite obviously how well he's doing at chelsea um, so, you know, Mancini has come out and said, you know, I never had any problems with the players. It was always the executives at Inter. And I think that's something they're trying to sort out and they want to change the whole structure of the sort of the top level of the club there. So it needs to be fixed because if you're going to spend that kind of money and really push for the title, um, you, you need to have those things in place. And it's disappointing because they were one of the best form teams, but the last three games have really dropped off now and I think it's really cost them. But fair play to Crotone because that, that's a huge result and um, one that may help them get out of the relegation zone. Yeah, huge, huge result. And, um, you know, fair play to them. I mean, they, they, were, <laughs> they were the better side for long spells, certainly in, in what I watched. So, uh, yeah, fair play to Crotone. Uh, let me run down the other results then from the weekend. Uh, we saw Saturday uh, Empoli drawing with Pescara by, uh, well, 1-1 scoreline. El Kaduri for, for Empoli and Caprari, a player I quite like uh, with the equaliser. Uh, Atalanta won, Sassuolo won. Slightly disappointing for Atalanta, you'd imagine. Uh, they'd be looking to win at home, but a draw. Uh, Pellegrini put Sass in front. Cristante got the equaliser. Um, we mentioned Juve and Chievo. Then on the Sunday, Samp, Fiorentina, the early game. Cracker actually 2 2. Rodriguez Babacar with a last minute equaliser after Alvarez put Sampdoria 2 1 in front after Bruno Fernandes had put them in front uh, originally after just five minutes. Uh, Udinese with a 3 0 victory. Rodrigo de Paul with two goals there and Zapata, Duban Zapata as well. Um, and that was a very, very decent performance that for Udinese. Um, had results, uh, certainly stuff to talk about with Genoa in a second. Uh, we've mentioned obviously to two Milan clubs. Roma keeping up the pressure on Juventus. 3-0 victory. Fazio, Mohamed Salah and Edin Dzeko keep scoring goals. 3-0 to them. And Torino with a lovely 3-2 victory of a Cagliari. Borriello putting the home side in front but goes from Lajic, Bellotti of course and Aqua who later got sent off for two yellows uh, one and uh, one back for uh, Quang Song Han for a uh, Cagliari wasn't enough. So win for Torino. Um, just before I give the listeners the table 
Uh, Genoa, managerial change? Uh, yes, managerial change. A couple of quick things, actually. Um, Genoa, they've sacked Mandalini uh, and they're bringing back Ivan Juric. Uh, so he would have taken training today. Um, so he's back at the club. Um, and also in those results, uh, Jan Pauli has been given a new contract at Sampdoria for his good work there. So very well done to him. Fully deserved. Um, and as you mentioned in that Calgary game, uh, Kwang Song Hearn is uh, not only the first North Korean player to play in Italy, but he's the first North Korean to ever score in Syria as well. Um, so a bit of a historical moment for him uh, North Koreans not liked very much in Italy as um, some people may not know or may not realise that North Korea were actually quite a good team in 1966 and famously beat Italy in the World Cup uh, over here in England in 66 so they're not remembered fondly but um, yeah apparently he's done really really well uh, scored a bicycle kick I think in uh, in the under 23s uh, game and then uh, got promoted to the first team and scored a goal so yeah very good performance yeah, absolutely, and uh, managerial change at this stage of the season uh, can either go one way or t'other. We shall see how that works out for Genoa. Uh, we should just run down the table then. Juve, as we know, are top, uh, probably going to win the league, realistically. They are six points clear of Roma in second, 77 points for Juve, 71 for Roma. Uh, Napoli are cementing third, 67 points for them, seven clear of Lazio in fourth after beating their nearest rivals last night, as we mentioned. Atalanta retain uh, fifth place, 59 points. Milan in sixth now is 57. Two points clear of their big rivals, Inter in seventh. Fiorentina, Samp and Torino make up that top 10. Uh, Udinese 11th, Kira 12th and Cagliari 13th with Bologna 14th, Sass 15th. Uh, Genoa, as we said, rotten runner form, changing their coach 16th on 29 points. And then there is a bit of a gap, 23 points for Empoli in 17th. Uh, 18 points, sorry, 18th Crotone on 20 points. So all of a sudden, the door is a creaking. Uh, and Palermo and Pescara, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're gone. Uh, I don't think you'll disagree, John, but I think they're gone. 14, yeah. 15 points. Um, yeah, and, and I think Palermo being relegated in the ra- most random way possible is probably the best thing for all <laughs> parties concerned. Uh, maybe just disbanding the club and starting again is the best way forward. Uh, I joke, of course, they're a club of great tradition, but it'd be nice to see them act like one. Uh, so that's them gone, I think. Uh, what about game for next week? What are we looking out for? Uh, it's very easy. It's the Derby della Madonia, uh, Inter Milan, Saturday, 11.30. Oh, beauty, beauty. Yeah. That's my evening sorted. Lovely job. So we shall look forward to that um, and get your questions in early for next week if you want to talk about that. Uh, right, OK. Uh, any, there's nothing else in Italy. I think that's everything wrapped up for another week. Yep. So uh, off to Germany we go then. And this is the part where John and I uh, try our best to entertain Joel um, and fudge our way through this week's Bundesliga. Right, John, we've um, we've picked out a selection of games, haven't we, just to sort mm-hmm. of uh, try and fudge our way through, as is always the case. Um, I wanted to start with your glad back, because why not? Um, very, very good win this, wasn't it? 3-2 against Cologne, um, even when Anthony Modeste scored, <laughs> um, and they still won. Yeah, the uh, the Ryan Derby, uh, huge game for both teams, uh, really bitter rivalry, and... Um, Despite the scoreline, uh, I'm going to be biased. Gladbach were the better team uh, for large parts of it. I thought we pressed really well. Um, we pressed them high at the pitch. We forced errors. We were winning second balls a lot. Um, obviously, Cologne did have their points in the game where they had a little bit of control, but they were very short spells. <clears throat> um, it was uh, Vestergaard who got the the scoring underway uh one nil from a from a oh, Forgan Hazard header uh from a corner sorry. Um just completely unmarked um Cone doing the, the zonal marking but uh not blocking off a runner and just got a just got a free run on his man. It was very easy. But Cone the whole way through the game, uh, every time they went a goal down they, they seemed to wake up and Anthony Modest, um, you know, we've talked about his goal scoring prowess. The one thing I've never realised is how good he is at passing the ball. There was the goal he set up for uh, Clemens, the, the equaliser. Fantastic. Uh, 
a uh, goal kick from Horn and Modest just brought it down on his chest, had the calmness to bring it down, awareness to look up and he played, must be a 25-30 yard ball, a uh, through ball on the ground, perfectly weighted, Clemens didn't have to break his stride, first time hit, really, really good goal. Um, then uh, that, that played out basically the first half and then into the second half, uh, Ibrahim Traore, who has been a bit missed this season, has been struggling with injury, he, uh, he came on and just... Uh, Immediately ran at the defence from the right-hand side, put a ball into the box. Um, it looked like uh, Stindl uh, had got a, a touch on it. Also looked like Hoffman had as well. But in the end, actually, neither of them did. And uh, it's one of those awkward ones where the goalkeeper expects the man running in front of him to flick the ball. And uh, Trioris cross basically just went in. So he came to goal. Um, Modest then, three minutes later, uh, as he's been doing all season, scored again. And it was a really, really good goal. Uh, definitely the goal of the game uh, brilliant cross um, and just the first time hit on the volley uh, in a box surrounded by people such a clean hit into the top corner um, and as we've said all season if he was just a few years younger there would be people crawling all over him trying to uh, trying to get him to sign because he's been superb this season um, I don't know what it is about Cone but he just seems to have found a, a comfortable home there um, but yeah, glad back again, fought back to take the lead, and it was uh, Lars Lindor, the man who just has been basically our best player all season. Um, he's only got eight goals this season, but he's got assists, he's led the line really well, he's not really a natural striker, but he's been really, really good. Um, Joseph Dermich actually had the original shot, which um, he was unlucky not to score from, actually hit the post and Lars Lindor followed up. But it was a really clever finish, past two defenders and the goalkeeper, just picked the right spot, very calm. Um, and to be honest, I think there's an argument for Stindl to be called up for the national team now. He's performed so well with that Gladbach team, which has struggled for large parts of the season, that I think he deserves a call up. And the fact is that Germany don't really play with a striker. Um, he's proved he can do that and that he's not a traditional you know, number nine type. He can fill in behind as well. He's got great movement, great understanding. Um, and I, I really think that there's there's a good argument for him to uh, at least be given the chance uh, at some point in that German team because I think he's got the ability to play with you know, the, the Mesut Ozil's, Marco Royce, those kind of players um, because that's basically the style of football that Gladbach do, do like to play is that quick and changing uh, lots of movement from the, from the front line and, and fluidness. So um, yeah, I hope for him he, he gets a call up but really, really good result for Gladbach. Um, you know, big plus points for Hecking obviously winning the derby. Uh, Cone will be a little bit de- disappointed. Uh, they put in a good performance, but Gladbeck definitely deserved the three points on the day. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. Uh, a couple of other games that we um, picked out. Schalke with a 4-1 victory over Wolfsburg. Um, I wouldn't say nobody saw this coming, but it's quite a battering, wasn't it? I mean, Wolfsburg have been much better under Andreas Jonker. Um, so, you know, that's a huge, hugely good result. Um, Bergstaller, I completely forgot. This was the same guy who was at Cardiff. Do you remember? I didn't. I didn't even realise that. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. He was at Cardiff, and he was absolutely turd. So um, he's having a lovely time. He, um, yeah, because he came in January from a Bundesliga Zwei team, I think. Did he not? Um, uh, it was January yes. he signed. Yeah, yeah. Nuremberg, think, wasn't it? Yeah, and yeah. I think he's. Um, I think he's got eight goals now already he's from January, which is obviously a brilliant return. But uh, yeah, Schalke were brilliant in this game. They were really, really good. Wolfsburg, to be fair, you know they've they've steadied a little bit but they've still got troubles there and they haven't got a great record in this particular match um, throughout the years but Schalke was just brilliant the the midfield was fantastic uh, Leon Goretzka who Drew can't stop talking about um, and you know wants Arsenal to sign and if not he wants Dortmund to sign and <laughs> you know uh, please maybe he can go to Holland at least so for some team that Drew supports so you can watch him week in week out um, but he was really good uh, Meyer who's a player I've always liked was really good putting the strings in at number 10 Chupa Motting who sometimes doesn't always put in the performance I thought was excellent uh, Kalasinic uh, the left back who uh, everyone seems to be fighting over in the summer who's a, who's on a free uh, was really really good raiding down that left hand side but yeah Berg, Bergstuhler he got two goals in this game uh, the second one in particular um, again a little bit like talked about with Anthony Modest he brings it down in the box with two defenders around him on his chest uh, takes a touch as he brings it down slides it one way to send the defence the wrong way and then and just calmly slots it in um, really, really good performance. The only disappointment Schalke will have is that they didn't keep the clean sheet at the end for the uh, the penalty they gave away on uh, Blaszczykowski. 
Yeah, yeah, I think it's um, yeah, small concerns at the end of the day with a result like that. But like you say, perfectionists uh, will feel that way. Um, there was uh, we'll obviously come on to the big game in a second. But the other quick one I wanted to mention was a very entertaining affair. Uh, on the Sunday, Ingolstadt winning against Darmstadt, uh, which on paper you might have looked at and gone, who the hell would watch this? But it's a really entertaining game. Um, all but seals Darmstadt's um, slip into Bundesliga Zwei because they're going down 15 points. They are massively cut adrift, 13 points adrift of, of Ingolstadt, whose win really cranks up the pressure on those above them. Um, they got a, a 3-2 victory. It's three wins on the spin for Ingolstadt. They suddenly hit form. Uh, a win away at Mainz, um, followed up by a win away at Augsburg, followed up by a win at home to Darmstadt. So a huge result for them. Um, excuse me. There's a very, very good free kick late on from uh, I think Sutner, I think his name is, mm. um, in this game. So um, uh, they went one up, then conceded two, and then ended up winning 3-2. So huge result from them. Um, very, very good game that. Well worth a, a watch of the highlights if you haven't seen it. Um, but we will finish our roundup, of course, with the big one. Uh, Drew, this is the time where you can shut your uh, device <laughs> off. Uh, <laughs> Bayern Munich 4, Borussia Dortmund 1. These games are usually quite closely contested, quite uh, quite narrow score lines. Uh, this was anything but. Um, Bayern just steamrolled Dortmund, didn't they? A lovely goal of the volley from Frank Ribery early on. A couple of goals from Lewandowski, won a penalty. Um, another team that insists on letting Iron Robin shoot with his left foot cutting inside <laughs> to uh, predictable, predictable results. Very, very good finish from Rafa Guerrero. Uh, has to be said for Dortmund, but... Yeah. Does this um, result overall just maybe put the brakes on people who think that Tuchel is, you know, the next big uh, manager to to hit world football? And or, or does it just underline just how far Bayern Munich are ahead of Dortmund because their squad on paper is just it's just just talent after talent after talent. You can bring people like Coman and Kimmich off the bench, and it's frightening, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think it is slightly. Uh, part of both uh, Dortmund were missing a few players um, notably uh, Julian Weigel would be the, the really big miss um, and I think that's part of the issue the the fact that you're missing Weigel who is what is he 21 22 yes. something like that um, right, you know he's a wonderful talent don't get me wrong but if he's one of your most important midfield players you're going to have some issues because you're going to you're lacking experience um, Dortmund could have actually got in front of this game Usman Dembele broke through in the box in the first minute um, and it, unfortunately he took the shot on his left foot and couldn't curl it um, you know and it was Ulrich in goal not not Manuel Neuer so could have caused some issues and maybe caused an upset but they didn't score and obviously Ribery gets the first goal and Lewandowski gets the second wonderful goal from Guerrero but I think their issue is lack of some experience in certain areas on the pitch Um and even if they're not on the pitch, sometimes it's just ha- nice having that older head in the dressing room, even if it's just a half-time, if they are a substitute, just someone to talk to, explain a couple of things. Because you can get it from the coach as well, but sometimes you need to hear it from another player around you. Um, and that's what they look like. But, you know, in fairness, when Bayern want to turn it on uh, and, you know, really crush a team, they can do. <laughs> for as good as Owen Robin was on the day, uh, and obviously he got his trademark, you know, left-footed uh, cutting goal, he tried that. I think I saw on the highlights five, six times, um, and Lewandowski must get so fed up with him because he just he refuses to go on the outside and cross with his right foot and give him an easy goal. And you saw quite a few times him complaining and stuff. Um, but yeah. Just, I think it was the perfect warm-up for the Real Madrid game. That's huge confidence against a team that are their traditional rivals, or have been for the last few years anyway, in terms of the Bundesliga. Um, so it's going to fill them full of confidence. I don't think the Bayern team are short of that by any sense. Um, Dortmund, I think this will be interesting with in regards to the Monaco game because both teams know basically how to attack. I don't think Dortmund know how to defend, whereas I suspect Monaco would be the much better at that, and Jardim has proved it before when he had that quite defensive Monaco team previously. Um, I do think Monaco will miss Bakayoko. That would be a huge loss in midfield, obviously, and uh, Sidibe is also out. Sidibe, yeah. yeah. He's got, uh, is it appendicitis, I think, something um, like that. Two, two broken ribs as well, I think. I think I'm right yeah, saying. I but think, yeah, appendicitis is the big issue. Yeah, he's, he's, he's got to have surgery for that, hasn't he? So he'll, he'll be out for a while. So there'll obviously be a big loss, but I think the Monaco team would be better in uh, defensively, at least they've, you know, Jardin seems to have drilled that. So it's definitely a question mark over Tuchel. Um, it's not the way he likes to play. And I don't think he's necessarily got the players there to do it um, to the best of their ability. Uh, as for Bayern, 
I'm really excited to see what they're going to uh, put out against Real Madrid because um, they kind of owe them one from, was it 4-0? They got beaten by Madrid when Ancelotti was the manager. So um, they'll be looking for revenge in that game. Well, it, it's almost like we've got uh, somebody who might know a bit about Real Madrid on, <laughs> on the line. So, uh, Joel, um, what, what do you think? I mean, is this the um, is this is this the perfect tie for Real Madrid? Is it the perfect tie for Bayern Munich, or is it one that you just can't separate the two at the moment? Um, I'd, yeah, I'd say you can't separate them at the minute. I think if anybody knows how to beat this Madrid team, it's Ancelotti, which I think is a massive advantage for him. To you know, he knows practically three quarters of that team and how it operates. And I actually think the um, Madrid team under Zidane are very similar to the Madrid team under Ancelotti as well. So I don't think there's much in between there. Um, so I think he'll be um, kind of on that and drilling Bayern into what he wants them to be able to do. Um, I think the injuries to Bayern are quite crucial. Obviously, I saw it seen today. Neuer's it's still a doubt. Hummels is definitely out. Lewandowski is a doubt. Um, I think that will play into Madrid's hands. But then, obviously, as I mentioned, they've not got any Pepe or Varane. So I see it as a scoring draw. I'm totally honest, which obviously benefits Madrid because they'll, they'll take the away goal. But then I can see. Bayern scoring at the Bernabeu as well because Madrid are not keeping clean sheets. So I think it'll be quite an open game. You know, saying that would be nil nil, but I think there will be goals in it. I do. Yeah, I think you're right. I'm going for a 2 2 draw on that one. Don't put money on it, boys and girls, because it'll only go wrong. <laughs> uh, right, let's quickly run through the other results in Bundesliga then and uh, have a look at a game. I think John's going to pick us out a game for next week. So, uh, other results this weekend then. We had a 2 uh, 1 victory for Hamburg, who have all of a sudden just picked up their uh, their form. They're up to 13th now, incredibly. 2 1 victory for Hoffenheim. Freiburg back to winning ways with a 1 0 victory over Mainz. Uh, Niels Pedersen with the winner there. Uh, RB Leipzig I watched this game uh, very very late winner over by Leverkusen Willie Orban was sent off late on but just two minutes later uh, Poulsen popped up with uh, yet another assist from uh, Emil Forsberg one of the most assisting players in Europe this season uh, of a 93rd minute winner 1-0 that one finished um, and then on the Sunday the only other game that we didn't cover was Hertha Bayer say winning 2-0 against Augsburg goals from John Brooks the American and Valentin Stocker and all of that leaves Bayern Munich top of the table on 68-10 clear of RB Leipzig on 58 of course uh, both 28 games played in fact everyone's played 28 now Hoffenheim third uh, a point clear of Borussia Dortmund in fourth and there's a seven point gap to Hertha in fifth with Freiburg yeah hey in sixth magnificent season considering they were promoted uh, FC Köln Gladbach up to eighth now Köln seventh with Eintracht Frankfurt mighty mighty Eagles ninth uh, with Schalke tenth Werder Bremen who has been the form team of late and beaten in five including three wins they are 11th and probably safe now Leverkusen still stuttering in 12th with Hamburg Wolfsburg and Mainz 13th 14th and 15th um, and then there's a uh, very very close at the bottom Augsburg 16th in the relegation playoff spot on goal difference alone 29 points same points as Mainz who've lost five on the spin uh, Ingolstadt with those three straight wins have given themselves a chance 28 points now just a point behind so another couple of wins that could all change I would go so far as to say that all the way up to Werder Bremen are still in danger I think Bremen will be fine but uh, even Leverkusen now are starting to look over their shoulders at the teams below them, particularly Hamburg, uh, Wolfsburg and Ingolstadt in form. So Darmstadt, as we said, probably dead. 15 points gone. Uh, John, is there a team, or, sorry, a game you'd like to pick out? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a battle at the bottom. Uh, we spoke about Ingolstadt uh, and their good result, and they're away to Wolfsburg, who are in terrible form. Um, so it's a really huge game down at the bottom of the table. Interesting. That is a game to keep an eye on. So mm-hmm. there you go. There is Bundesliga done for a, another week. Um, and as I say, uh, questions, ping them Drew's way. Um, we did get a question last week, which I'm still... Um, I, actually, it's my own fault. I meant to nudge Drew and ask him if he'd have, had a, an answer for me. Um, I'm just looking at the person who asked us the question just to give him a shout out so they're not forgotten. Uh, frantically, looks, frantically looks through emails... And I still can't find it. I will find it. But we had a question um, on Dortmund, uh, which was for Drew from one of our listeners, uh, which it should come up in a second. So Drew will answer that question uh, hopefully next week. I did remind him, but um, then I forgot. Sorry about that. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you for your question, sir. If you're listening, um, I will. F- Tomac, that was your name. There we go. Found it in the end. It's a question on Dortmund. So uh, Tomac, I haven't forgotten you. It will get answered eventually. 
Right, OK, uh, we're going to move on then to another roundup from another league that we don't talk about very much as we go for a little trip around another place in Europe for this week's best and the rest. Okay, this week's Best of the Rest, we're going to take a trip to the Czech Republic, of all places. Uh, This means I get to butcher some names, so sit tight and get comfy. Here we go. Uh, Victoria Pilsen, I can just about get that one right. They are currently top of the Czech League. 23 games played, by the way, in a 16-team league, so it's getting close to the old crunch time for this league. They are only one point clear of Slavia Prague, who've got 52 points. Uh, Both of those teams won this weekend victory for Pilsen over Hradzek uh, Kralovi. Oh, there we go. It all begins. 1-0 away from home. Uh, Slavia Prague, meanwhile, picking up a 2-1 victory over Karvinia. You can just about pronounce that one. Uh, Sparta Prague, the uh, big rivals of Slavia, are in third. Uh, they also got a win this weekend. 43 points is quite a gap there. Uh, they beat a team I can't pronounce, uh, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but uh, Bruno is the second part of their name. Uh, shall I give it one go? I'll give it one go. Je no, I'm not going to try again. Um, Mlada Bolislav are in fourth. Uh, they could do with having an easier name as well, but they are currently fourth of the table on 38 points uh, with the lovely named Zlin, uh, fifth, and Tepliche are sixth on 34 points. Uh, down at the bottom, uh, Pribram are bottom of the table, 15 points uh, for them, so they are having a bit of a poor season. Uh, Vrissonslia Yinlava. Oh, crikey. 17 points. Uh, they're second bottom. Those two look like the two that are going to go because there's a four point gap then to Radlek Kraklove. So uh, they've got 21 points. And then the team that I once again can't pronounce are in 13th. I'm really sorry if you support that team. I've got to be honest, I don't think there's going to be any listeners that do. But I can tell you they've uh, they drew four straight games before losing this weekend. So there you go. Uh, John, do you want to have a go at this? Zreblo uh, Jovka, Bruno? Oh, no. yeah, no. <laughs> no, OK, we'll leave them where they are. Uh, the only other team to mention that's a bit of a surprise, Slovan Liberec, um, who a lot of lot of people there uh, from sort of familiar with the European game uh, might have known that uh, particular name of that team. They're sitting 12th out of 16 teams. So um, one of sort of Europe's old fashioned names having a real struggle. So there we go. There's another little um, glimpse into the great wide world of the European game. Uh, That is the Czech Republic uh, done for another another. Well, probably another season, let's be honest, because quite frankly, I don't want to have to pronounce that team ever again. So uh, good luck to Victoria Pilsen and Slavia Prague, who look like they're going to fight it out for the title. We're going to have a very busy pod at the end of the season going through all these leagues that we've covered with their results, aren't we? Crikey. Anyway, we will leave that there for another week. Uh, As we always say, if there's a league you want us to focus on, drop us a tweet. We'll do our best. Right. uh, Two segments to go. Uh, We're going to profile a player now. And I'm delighted to say this week's player comes from League R. It's this week's Hipster's Choice. OK, so this week's choice, as we say, it's a Liga player because I didn't have a lot of time to put this one together. Um, and it's a player who featured against PSG just this past weekend, or his club did at least. Uh, this week's hipster's choice is Gangops Marcos Coco. So what do we know about Marcos Coco? Well, he is a midfielder slash wide forward slash attacking midfielder. He plays for Gangop in France. He's 24 years of age and is a French under 21 international. He's 20 years of age. He was born on the 24th of June 1996. He's a six foot and a half inch tall. 165 pounds and he's right footed you can follow him at twitter slash stalk him on twitter because we know what you lot are like uh, at marcos uh, marcus with a u uh, marcus with an m-a-u-k-s so uh, yeah that's an interesting one he is verified so apparently it is him 
So he was born in the Caribbean French territory. Uh, Guadalupe, 20-year-old Marcus Coco, is a midfielder. As we said, four going up in Ligue 1. And as we said, a uh, French under-21 international capped to this point as well. Uh, until 2013, Coco played most of his football in the amateur divisions in Paris until he signed for Gangon, originally tested as a defensive midfielder due to his size and presence, until it became clear that his explosive pace and the fact that he wasn't a natural ball winner was more suited to the wing or indeed on the flank. In February 2015, Coco made his Ligue 1 debut against Bordeaux and from there has established himself as a first teamer, making 30 appearances in 15, 16 and 27 thus far this term. Although he played regularly in the 2015, excuse me, 16 season, he managed only one goal and two assists. The latter somewhat telling people that uh, with so much pace on the wings, that little end product. The player himself admitted that he needed to be more clinical, both with his crossing ability and presenting with goal scoring opportunities, finishing. And although he wasn't shy of uh, taking on defenders, he was dispossessed far too often. Gangong, however, were languishing at the bottom of Liga. For most of the 2015-16 season and at the end of the season Anton Kambouare was replaced by uh, Jocelyn Govanek as manager Govanek served the club well earning the promotion in 2013 qualified twice in the Europa League however it was widely thought he'd taken the club as far as he could uh, under Kambouare in the first half of the 16-17 season Gangon were revitalised and experimented with new formations notably the 4-3-3 which uh, Coco thrived in as a wide forward with great success uh, Coco's most impressive performance came in October when he scored two goals and was man of the match in an impressive 3-1 win away at Lyon and scored two other goals in the first half of the season against Montpellier and Dijon. Since the new year, both Gangop and Coco have suffered a dip in form, dropping to 10th in Liga. However, there's still some bright spots for the young midfielder. An impressive performance in the system, a 1-1 draw against Montpellier and indeed the 5-0 thrashing of SC Bastia in the league. A rising star, Coco, who has been dubbed as the French Speedy Gonzalez, which I love, uh, has all the attributes of a great attacking wide midfielder. Hopefully, uh, hopefully he doesn't see a walk at it, as Kelly's uh, affectionately put in this roundup. Uh, he's made six appearances for the French under-21s and undoubtedly aspires to receive a call-up to the French senior team. Now, uh, I'm fully aware that uh, our uh, our hipsters here uh, may not have uh, too big a knowledge of Marcus Coco. So um, I'm not going to um, insult their intelligence by asking them if they've seen him play, because I'm sure the answer will be no. So I'm <laughs> simply going to ask them. Uh, I want from you, gentlemen, uh, one player from your respective leagues, from, some, from Serie A and from La Liga, uh, a wide forward slash attacking midfielder slash player who's got lots of pace and potential, but they're not quite sure where their best position is yet. So, uh, John, you uh, you can go first. Anyone in Italy that that sort of description leaps out at you? Um, Felipe Anderson, maybe. Um, oh, that was the one I thought of, funnily enough, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of established himself on the right-hand side, but I think he can play either. Uh, I susp- he could play number 10 as well, and there's a hint a couple of times when he sort of floats in for Immobile when they sort of swap positions and things like that, so maybe he could play f- straight through the middle up top. Um he would be the most uh, obvious one uh, out of everyone. The only other one you could maybe throw out is Insigne, who, although he's established himself a little bit more uh, as solid on that left-hand side because there was always talk that he should be a number 10 more than anything else. Yeah, and by Niang would have been the obvious choice had he not mm. left for Watford, of course, but he did, so we can't have him. Um, what about yourself, Joe? Anybody in, in Spain that sort of leaps out, maybe at a lesser club that, that could make the step up but has yet to nail down a position? Uh I think it's a player that's at a big club, but has not got a position as such. Would be Carrasco, Atletico ah, Madrid, seems to flip from great shout, yeah, left side to right side. Plays off the striker, plays as a striker, can even play, you know, in in the hole in front of the two holding midfielders. So I think he's a player that needs to define a position and define some form as well. Because on his day, there's, there's not much many better players than him in Europe, but his day isn't so good, and he's, he's quite easily left out by Simeone as well. So I'd, I'd go for Carrasco if I'm honest. Mm. Yeah, great shout, great shout. And um, one other very quick question to you both. Uh, Joel, I'll start with you. Any clubs in Spain that you think could potentially pick up uh, yet another sort of tricky winner, winger from the French League? Because um, we all know that teams tend to look at the French League when they're looking for a bargain. So is there any mid-table size that could profit from a speedy winger with an eye for goal? Uh, I'd, I'd, not so much mid-table, but I'd go to Seville. Ah, yes. Just love the French market, love a bargain and love a winger with pace so yeah I'd go for Sevilla 
Yeah, great shout. Anyone from Italy, John, that you're aware of? Uh, well, Milan would certainly be, be looking. They need to strengthen. Um, Atalanta will need to buy some people because no doubt half their squad is about to be yeah, uh, raided up, yeah. Yeah, uh, in the summer. Um, and Lazio would be another one as well because I'm, I'm fairly sure Cater will be gone. Uh, Philippe Anderson still rumours linking into the Premier League. So um, there'll be some spots open there. Yeah, very much so, very much so. So that's Marcos Coco then placed into our hipsters uh, Hall of Fame, if you will. Uh, I know he's been very heavily linked with the Premier League this summer, particularly with Leicester. Um, So that could be an interesting move uh, if that comes across. And uh, hopefully he continues to get back to the the form of glimpses he's shown this season. So there we go. Uh, Any questions on him? Um, Tweet me and I'll do my very best to answer them. Uh, Or indeed, I will throw my hands in the air and say I have no idea that's what the hipsters is all about right uh we'll finish then with our final section of the podcast where we answer your questions and i can tell you we've only got one one solitary question is this week's on your bag okay now in the absence of the uh the questions um i'm going to try and dig out I think we've got just enough time for one question each to my hipsters, which are going to be questions of my choice, <laughs> which means no preparation time for our hipsters. But we have had one question, and it's from our good friend, uh, Mr. Five Star Flips himself, Tom. Um, over the time you guys have followed your respective leagues, can you think of any signings that have never lived up to the expectation but seemed like great business or a great fit at the time? Joel, who are you going to pick on in the Liga? Um, there's two players I've changed my mind from when I first saw the question so my first thought was um, Kaká when he went to Real Madrid oh good shout um, you know 65 million euros huge signing so much potential just never ever ever worked for him Real Madrid um, but he's not the one I'm going to go with the one I'm going to go with in terms of natural fit and a homecoming and the team was perfect for him is Fabregas um, yes that- kind of went there and it was just like this is the most natural fit ever he's going to take the team on he just never got it from day one and couldn't really find a position for him he moved around from the left side right side holding midfielder attacking midfielder number 10 it just um, didn't really work for Fabregas and I think that was the most disappointing of all the players that could have brought back you know they brought PK back brought Jordi Alba back I think Fabregas was the one way he just thought this is going to work it just never ever did and then for them to end up selling him um, just said everything really so, yeah, that'd be the one I'd go for. There's, there's lots in there. You could have had Danielson, Gerard Batista all them years ago. Um, yeah. Even James Rodriguez you could put into that category now because it's just been such a disaster since Zidane's took charge. Real yeah. Madrid. Um, and even Ibrahimovic when Barca lost about €40 million Euros on him. That could be seen as a, a poor fit and a poor signing as well. So there's quite a lot. I'm sure if you dig through that, there'd be quite a lot of examples. Do you know the one I chuck at you? And um, it's more because I'm so disappointed because I just wanted to see more. And that's um, Paolo Higiganso at Sevilla. I really thought under a good coach like San Paolo, he would know his game when he was back in Brazil, when he was at San Paolo. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'll give him games. And it's just not worked, has it? So that's another shame. But it is what it is. What about you, John? Anybody in, in Italy that comes to mind? Um, there's lots of sort of players who were hyped up but hadn't really done it anywhere else. So I thought I'd pick someone who uh, had a very good career and then moved to Italy and failed. Um, and the biggest example I found was uh, Mandietta, uh, signed oh, for Lazio yeah. from Valencia. And it was for, I'll just check the fee again, uh, 48 million euros at the time, wow. um, which was huge. He was the sixth most expensive player at the time when they signed him. Um, yeah, came to Lazio, was there for one season, uh, played 31 games, didn't score a single goal, completely flopped. Um, that was the Lazio team as well, obviously, that were you know defending the title and, and had so many great players. Um, he'd had a really good career at Valencia, he was really, really good in La Liga. He'd won European midfielder of the year, I think, the, the, before they signed him. Uh, just didn't work out. Uh, then he got loaned to Barca. Um, Barca in the end weren't interested in him um, and obviously then he went to Middlesbrough where he actually had a really good career um, it was it, kind of a strange trajectory uh, from you know Spain, Italy and then going to Borough but you know Borough were a Premier League side who they did okay they you know uh, I'm not sure did they win a they got to a couple of cup finals or something like that I think during that period um, and he was one of their big star players but for whatever reason didn't work out um, 
uh, in Italy, uh, and it's quite funny that happens quite a lot with midfielders in in Italy fo- Italian football. You, you think of the sort of reverse of uh, Veron, who went to Manchester United, was awful, just couldn't cut it in the Premier League for whatever reason. But in Italy, was probably the best midfielder three years running. So um, yeah. yeah, there was there was quite a few names. The other one I was going to go for was Adriano, who uh, Roma signed after he'd gone back to Brazil. Uh, obviously, he was brilliant. Uh, when he was at Inter and scored loads of goals and then kind of went off the boil, went back to Brazil, uh, seemed to have found his form again, went to Roma and was terrible and massively overweight. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there was quite a few candidates. Yes, yeah, there and, and there wasn't many candidates for France. I'm sure people will tweet me in and say, you know, that, that you could have played this player, that player. But I've gone for two obvious ones. They're both PSG players. Um, Joel tipped me off on this one because I've completely forgotten because he's been completely forgotten. Gregor Skoskowiak at PSG, um, fantastic for Sevilla. Really, really was one of Europe's best midfielders for interceptions and, and breaking up play last season. Really was heralded as a, a huge signing for PSG and has just not played and has gone backwards massively attitude question the lot so he's he's a, a huge one um, and the obvious one at PSG is probably Hatem Ben Arfa um, who on his day absolutely no questioning how much ability he's got no questioning how uh, how much of an ability um, or how much ability he has to change a game as well he's a, he's a magnificent player uh, but it's just not worked at PSG and, and as, as much money as he's earned from the deal and I'm sure he has earned quite a lot of money uh, I can't help but wonder um, whether he'd have been better staying at Nice uh, for another season imagine him and Mario that would have been lovely wouldn't it but um, fireworks all over the place literally but uh, I think he'll move on in the summer where Pfft, anyone's guess but um, I can actually see him nipping off to Spain uh, maybe joining the Las Palmas project that'd be quite fun wouldn't it with Karen Prince Boateng and Hesse but yeah it's it's a real shame because he's a huge talent but it just hasn't worked out for him so that's my answer to that one. Great question, as usual, Tom. Um, and in the absence of any other questions, I'm simply going to ask you these uh, this question to finish, guys. Uh, just a very short answer from you both. Uh, I want you to give me one young player. And by young player, I mean 23 or under to watch this weekend. I know that's. I know that's. I've dropped oh. that on you. I, oh, <laughs> come on! Last hundreds minute. in Italy. Hundreds in Italy. Uh, I'll, I'll. I'll pick on Joel first. So, uh, Joel, I'm sure you've got hundreds of us, hundreds of players you could give us. But one young player in La Liga this weekend that you think will play and is worth having a little look at. Um, I'll go on the basis of the game I suggested earlier. So I'll go for Valencia Sevilla, and I'll go Jose Gea, the left back at Valencia. He should be back this weekend. He's a tremendous talent. Definitely won't be at Valencia for much longer. Um, and he's le- next in the production line of quality left backs that um, Valencia have produced after kind of having Alba and Juan Bernat. So yeah, I'd go Jose Gay. And I think he's 21, so that qualifies him under 23. Fantastic. See, John, that, that's what you call precise and succinct. He's not only pulled out a player off the top of his head, but he's pulled out a player from the game he said to watch as well. So, so He's given me no, the best no idea then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah from, no who, uh, from the From the Milan derby, um, he should be back in the team, uh, Gagliardini, uh, for Inter. Uh, he's 22, so he qualifies. Um, he's been one of the sort of stars of the team uh, for a guy who hardly played in Serie A football. If he doesn't start, because um, he was an injury worry and only came as a sub uh, in the previous game, um, then you can look to uh, the other Milan team, AC Milan and Locatelli, who is 18? I think he might be 19 now. Um, so yeah, if the pair of them are playing, that's, that'll be a really good midfield battle. Yes, indeed. Um, I know you're going to pick on me and say, well, if we've answered it, you've got to answer it as well. So uh, as, as a, a consummate professional that I am, uh, I've picked one out. Although I didn't realise he's actually 25. So that kind of kills me a bit, doesn't it? Because I said 24 or under. So um, I'll try and... Well, actually, no, I can pick two. Um, St. Etienne Marseille is the game I went for at the weekend. Uh, and I go. For, uh, I was going to go for Kevin Malsui, uh, who's the um, attacking fullback that people are raving about for, um, for St. Etienne this season. But seeing as I've got to stick to the rules, I will stick to the rules. Uh, Pierre Gabriel who's also uh, a player who's getting games at the moment for St Etienne. Another attacking fullback, uh, French. He's only 18. Uh, so, yes, uh, Ronel Pierre-Gabriel is one to keep a little eye on as well. So, there you go. Right, OK. Um, that will do us then. Uh, I'm off to uh, enjoy another rip-snortingly entertaining uh, local football 
uh, FA meeting. So pray for me as you listen to this. Uh, this podcast, I'm sure, will be released on the Tuesday. Uh, so please enjoy. Uh, keep your feedback coming. We are at the FH Podcast. We're on the SoundCloud, iTunes and YouTube are our big three, as well as some of the other apps like Stitcher, for example. You can get us on or indeed our website. Uh, please do keep that feedback coming in. We like to hear from you. Um, and one thing we always encourage, if you have a thought when you're listening to the podcast and you want to share your views, just chuck us a tweet. Uh, please feel free. We we do read them genuinely. Um, it's only one of us uh, any one time monitoring the twitter account um because we've all got lives of course but generally if you get a little favor a little heart on your tweet it means we've seen it and we've acknowledged it so uh please do send us that and one of the plug i must mention i must mention this uh korosh our good friend korosh um published a blog for us uh which is up on our website right now so if you go to our website footballhitspodcast.co.uk click on the blogs tab it's called shelka 04 an opinion about a fan regime it's a very very good read um really really good insightful stuff from korosh about Schalke and the fan regime that's there and it, it certainly ties into many other clubs as well so please do give that a look um and you can uh, look up uh, korosh on twitter as well. i think he's at dwarf guna as well as that korosh Mustafa. He's, he's got uh, two accounts because he's that damn cool so uh, give korosh some love if you read his blog um, and finally, just a reminder, if you want that 10% off code for classicfootballshirts.co.uk, CFSAW10. Get involved, people. Right, that's it for another week then. Uh, many thanks for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate every single one of you. Uh, enjoy your week's football. My thanks, of course, to both Joel and John. Thank you, gentlemen. Cheers, Chris. Cheers, Chris. And uh, we will be back with the English Breakfast podcast on Sunday, which Ross did a wonderful job hosting in my absence yesterday. Uh, it will probably be me, Ross, and Joel, and Josh, and uh, sorry, and uh, I always get that name wrong. Uh, Josh, jo- Josh, Joel, and Ross. There you go, or myself. We will be back with that on Sunday, probably talking a lot more clearly than I just did. So until then, enjoy your football, and we will speak to you very soon. Mm-hmm.